let's see. Okay, we're live. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 101 of the Security Podcast. And I'll just warn you ahead of time, it's going to be probably on the short side today, we think, because we have some news, but not like this great, like, let's talk for 30 minutes about one topic type thing. So let's just start with Tom. Tom's going to, like, walk us through all these little news stories that we have, and we'll go from there. Yeah, we've we've got you know some tiny news stories, but uh, you know overall, I think today is a good day for encryption, good day for security, and uh, you know good day for for uh, users who think in general. Uh, we've got uh, you know a, a desktop release, a Chrome extension, a Chrome app of Signal, the awesome, fantastic encrypted messaging platform for iOS and Android. Uh, it again made by Moxie Marlin Spike. Uh, it's pre-internet encryption. Uh, it encrypts on your device. Signal doesn't hold the keys. It's really the best case scenario for encrypted messaging, uh, and it works decently well. We were talking about some bugs that we've seen. Um, it's they will be fixed undoubtedly, uh, but right now it's still kind of rough around the edges. But uh, if you like security, if you're looking for a new messaging platform, uh, if you're looking for something that'll work cross-platform with other people and in the browser now, um, Signal looks to be the way to go. Well, it's uh, we had the problem with Signal way back when. It wasn't just catching on. It was tech secure, and then they had Signal. Yep. They merged together. I've been using it. I have a very weird SMS bug where in group messaging platforms, I use my Google Voice number to people to send me messages, all this other stuff. It didn't work. And now it seems to be working. And for me, Signal is just, it's it's excellent. So I want to recommend it to everybody. I will say that if you're on iOS, t give Signal a look, but most likely you're probably going to end up staying with messages. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, if you're on Android, it's very simple just to switch over your SMS uh, and MMS platform to Signal. And now with this release of a desktop client, I, I've been playing with it for the last couple a day or so, and it's been pretty good. Not a day, a couple hours. It's it's a Chrome extension, like Tom said, which was my limiting factor. I use a Chromebook the majority of the time at work, and to have no way of downloading an app and installing it, I, I couldn't do anything other than uh, Google Hangouts, which I really do like. But if you want to have that security and everything else, now Signal's a Chrome extension in the browser, and you're good to go, and it seems simple enough. One thing that uh, we do have to mention is right now, uh, when you're trying to launch and link up the, the Chrome extension, uh, you need an Android phone. It does not work with iOS at the moment. Uh, they are working on it. It's a high priority. It'll get done uh, probably by, well, probably, hopefully by the time this podcast comes out. So uh, definitely check it out. It, uh, it looks to be... Uh, I, I'm hoping to make it my Hangouts replacement. I mean, yeah, it's it's people are saying, well, I have an iPhone, and you know what? Like I said, if you're, I mean, remember, iMessage, it, Apple controls the keys, so you have to worry about that. But at the end of the day, no one, no third party other than Apple can get it. It's not like Microsoft are going to steal the keys, so it's not as secure as we would want it to be, but. Hey, it's encrypted end to end from that end, and they have to ask Apple, which Apple said, "Hey, we can't do it until the government steps in and says you have to do this or else." Right, and uh, I, I do believe we had a uh, a quick question about Signal in particular. Um, yeah, so, uh, the, some uh, a listener last week asked us, or a couple weeks ago, said which messaging platform should we use, and we both said use Signal, and he came back and he said, "Well." How, how do I know that it's encrypted? If, can my ISP track it? And I initially said no, because it's 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 done on the phone and then sent out, and Tom's going to agree with me and give me more detail. Right. So so what happens is when Signal uh, or, or any end-to-end -end encrypted system, not necessarily you know going through SSL, it helps, but anything that's pre-internet encryption, even if you're sending it over HTTPS, even if you're if you've got SSL man in the middle attacks going on, uh, as long as the encryption happens here before it gets sent out to the internet, it's safe. Uh, you know, with the assumption that they're using something like OTR 
or another or PGP or another well-respected uh, cryptography uh, standard. Um, you know, just because you use a, a Caesar cipher and replace all the A's with Z's and uh, at signs for A's doesn't mean your message is encrypted. Uh, but you know, Signal is doing it right. All the encryption happens on the device itself before it touches the network. Uh, and that means even if your link is completely compromised, even if your ISP is watching everything you're doing, uh, they have no data except for uh, they see you talking to a server uh, and that's it. Well, and like we said, again, this is why we like it and we're recommending it. And it solves my biggest issue of having some sort of desktop client because for the most part, it's easy. I sit at the desktop all day and I type all day. I don't want to have to do it on my phone. So right now, signal right. is it. So yeah, just, just like most other um, you know security platforms or encryption, uh, your ISP can tell that you are sending encrypted traffic. Uh, they can tell that you're talking to Signal or to a certain server, um, but they cannot tell the content. So metadata is alive and well. So what's the next story? What else do we have? Next story, we've got um, we've got something uh, something tiny. Uh, there's you know, just like uh, the crypto wall and crypto locker ransomware. There's a bunch of ransomware, a bunch of copycats coming out of the woodwork. Some people do it good, some people do it poorly. Um, but uh, this one, uh, it, there's a, a story that Trend Micro put out on their their uh, Trend Lab security intelligence blog uh, about the Chimera ransomware. And it, it does the same sort of stuff that any ransomware does. It encrypts your files, it begs you for some bitcoins, and you know, hopefully if you give it Bitcoins, it'll decrypt, um, doesn't have to. Uh, there's no guarantee when you're dealing with uh, a ransom. Uh, but in the, uh, uh, in the source code, uh, when, when they broke it down, it looks like these people are advertising. They've got a message in English and a message in German um, <laughs> in these comments here that say, hey, uh, if you're interested in spreading this malware, uh, let us know because we have an affiliate program. We'll give you fifty uh, percent of our profits, which is absolutely ridiculous. You know, I'm, I'm used to Amazon or, or other people having affiliate programs, but malware authors are now offering affiliate programs. Well, I mean, if you can't, ridiculous. I mean, if you're going to script Kitty, the original uh, crypto locker, you might as well uh, make some money off of it. I mean, now other people can do the illegal stuff. All you're doing is providing an encryption service, right? I mean, <laughs> yes, I'm a, an encryption service. I'm a legitimate business. I mean, right? <laughs> can here's the question: Can you 1099 the employees? Are they employees? Yeah. Well, they're getting paid in Bitcoin, so it's not a wage. Uh, it's property and I you might be subject to some sort of property or gift tax at that point. I mean, remember, you can't skirt the IRS. So no. so so do you have to I mean, it sounds like you could run a legitimate organization. Yeah, you're really you're just providing an encryption service and you're bad at your business. You're able to de encrypt all the data and protect people, but for them to decrypt it, you know, you need to prove that they're them by asking for some money. It just absolutely. seems absolutely natural. I think it's, I think it's I think it's perfect. It's for when security is really important and you can't yeah. be trusted with the key. Exactly. I mean, I think this is perfect. And then you then you have affiliates going out saying, "Hey, we offer this <laughs> service. Uh, can, can you do it?" And you only have to pay us when you want your data back. Yeah. I, you know, I think we've got a great business opportunity here now. So instead of podcasting. I think we should just build this encryption software. Cloud, it's cloud, it's unlimited, it's free. Well, it's free, unlimited cloud storage. Yeah, except that, not in the cloud on your hard drive, but it's encrypted on your hard drive. No one can access that data until you pay us, and then we'll we'll figure out a way to get it for you. Yeah, I, I think this is perfect. I. I <laughs> And I think they should. Uh, yeah, I think I think we have to ten ninety nine anybody who wants to do this. Mm -hmm. We want to be legitimate businessmen. 
Oh, yes. Yes. So, Denise concrete shoes do not sell themselves. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is great. It's, let's let's create, let's take uh, Crypto Locker and let's uh, fork it on GitHub. <laughs> and then let's add our own code to say pay us money. I, I think someone actually already did that. Someone's got some open source Crypto Locker code. Um, that's, uh, oh, actually, there was another story about that. So the guy put out open source crypto locker code and said, hey, here you go. It's on GitHub. Uh, have at it. Uh, and he wanted to see how many people were paying attention and how many people would be outraged. Uh, and there's plenty of outrage, and a few people were paying attention. Um, and he actually saw this used in some malware that got out there. Um, once the malware had you know spread a little bit, he he put out another blog post saying, hey, uh, this encryption is totally broken. Here's how you reverse engineer it because I did it wrong and here are the flaws. So anyone hit by that malware can easily have their data decrypted and given back to them. Uh, it, it was really cool, fantastic article. Um, I'll have to find that. Um, but it was, it was about a week or two ago. Well, let's continue. Uh, what's, do you have another story? I do. Uh, I think I think I've got two two more stories and uh, and a funny anecdote, and that's really about it. Okay. Okay. So first, the bad news, uh, especially if you live in Kazakhstan. Um, they uh, this page has been uh, removed since uh, since the news story broke. Uh, it looks like. But um, it looks like the country is going to require Internet users to install a root certificate on their computers, phones, tablets, everything, uh, in order to access the Internet, uh, because it will protect them when they access uh, foreign servers. It, it will uh, encrypt their connection. It's, it's for their protection. Absolutely. This is like the the China the China Great Wall. It's it's like the China Great Wall, except um, there's no engineering to it. And and someone actually said this on Hacker News. Um, they they were lamenting the fact that you know China has put so much work at engineering and in their all their computer science minds into making the Great Firewall of China. Uh, and Kazakhstan just blasted out a memo to all of their citizens saying, hey, uh, can you just install this cert? Right? China doesn't have to, or Kazakhstan doesn't have to worry about breaking encryption or watching metadata or doing any big data analysis. They just say, hey, uh, install the cert or you know, you'll be arrested. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's another way to do it. Uh, but the the way they spun this is they they tried to say, hey, you know, it, the internet's a big, scary, dangerous place. But if you install our security certificate, it will keep you safe. And I mean, if if you trust your government, and a lot of people do trust their governments, um, you're not going to question this. If you don't know how computers work, and most people don't know how computers work, what this is doing is because you have a root certificate on your machine. Everything going in and out of the ISP mandated is being inspected by the government. Now, normally, in the case, you know, it, let's say you're living in the U.S. or any other nation which doesn't do many in the middle attacks on you. Um, when you connect HTTPS, your ISP, you know, points you to Google, you attach to Google, uh, and then Google does some nice encryption magic to make a tunnel between it and you and nothing in the middle. Uh, is exposed to the air. Nothing in the middle is clear text. Uh, the ISP can look at it all they want, but all they see is random noise. It's just, it's trash. It's encrypted traffic, and they can't break it. If they do break it, and you've probably seen it when, when you're browsing around, you get the big red scary screen that says, whoa, there's something wrong with this site's certificate. Um, so you know that someone is actively trying to attack you, or someone didn't, you know, renew their certificate in time, or didn't bother to pay for one. Um, but with with a root certificate, those scary warning screens will never come up. Instead, um, you will connect to the ISP. The ISP will hand you their you know other end of the certificate, uh, and then they'll pass you through to Google, and they get all of the traffic in between. 
you know, usernames, passwords, literally everything going in that wire. Uh, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, the only thing that can stop that, the only thing that can protect you at that point is pre-internet encryption. Well, we spoke about, I think we spoke about this, or at least we've been talking about this for years now, about how how companies, your work, my work, or I mean, if they do, install their own man-in-the-middle certificates just to capture all the data. Right. Yes, so, they do. So this is just essentially the same thing. It is. It's it's the same thing, but instead of a corporate scale, instead of saying, hey, you know, when you're in the office, we're going to watch all your internet traffic, which is kind of common, um, they're instead saying... You know, hey, when you live in this country, when you're a citizen of this nation, we get all of your internet traffic. So, and and the problem is, is that corporate IT is probably not too concerned with you unless you're doing something bad, whereas nation state IT has an unlimited amount of money to to find the things you're doing. Right, right. So. It's... There's a, there's a great Hacker News um, comment thread of people talking about this. Um, and there's, there's a citizen of, uh, of Kazakhstan saying, what, what do we do? This is, this is awful. What do we do? Um, and there's, there's not any sort of you know, great solution to this for the vast majority of people, right? Um, Microsoft can try to ban their certificate with a Windows update. Uh, but, you know, if you're intercepting the traffic, you don't have to let those updates go through. There's there's a lot of ways to try to head this off at the pass, but, you know, when, when you're controlling the pipe, it's hard to get anything past it, uh, unless, unless you're using something like Tor, uh, in which case Tor is designed to brute force its way through any type of restriction or surveillance uh, that it's literally designed to do that to operate in you know really downright awful horrible environments for computer security uh, so tor would be one of the good answers here and then while we're talking about nation states you want to talk about the the neighbors to kazakhstan to i think the east which is pakistan yeah um and actually i think you're probably more familiar with this story than i am so, so BlackBerry, and there's two parts of the story, but BlackBerry basically told Pakistan, uh, we're, we're taking our ball and going home. As in, they're not having the BlackBerry messenger, the BlackBerry services or their phones allowed in the country. Pakistan said, you need to give us a way to intercept all traffic. And BlackBerry said, uh, no, we are not going to do that, which we commend them for. But it's a little too little too late, because if you remember five years ago, a, a UAE, the United Arab Emirates and India both said the same thing and they, quote unquote, worked out a deal, whatever that means. And I guess if you, you definitely want to be in India, so you'll do whatever it can to be there. Maybe in Pakistan, you said, yeah, it's not that big of a market or we really want to stand up to privacy. But I, with this case, I think it's a little too little too late. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunately, you know, Rim, the uh, the company that owns the BlackBerry brand, they uh, they they totally got rid of their their great security lead. They were fantastic, right? BlackBerry Messenger was this great thing that was really secure. Um, it, governments couldn't get into it; they couldn't break into it. Um, super secure platform. Uh, but again, you're trusting BlackBerry, you're trusting RIM because they hold the keys, right? You're running through their servers unless you're using a corporate enterprise server that manages the keys for you. Um, so BlackBerry Messenger was seen as, you know, a great way to protect corporate data. You could talk to everyone, everyone had a BlackBerry. You know, it was it was a glorious grand time in enterprise IT. Uh, you know, they were awful to manage on the IT side, but from a user's perspective, they worked pretty well, and they were secure by default. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, they, they got to other markets and they said, oh, we want a piece of this pie, and government said, hey, sure, you can sell the BlackBerry here, but only if we get to read all the messages. Uh, and so they had to build in governmental backdoors, and you know, at that point, they became an untrusted player. Uh, at that point, BlackBerry Messenger was assumed to be compromised six ways to Sunday, uh, and 
uh, the security people stopped recommending it. Um, you know, it, something like this where, where you walk away from something and say, oh, well, we're not going to give you made in the middle privileges on our platform. Uh, great. That's, that's fantastic. That's the right answer. But too little, too late, right? You, you already soiled the water. You already got rid of all of the good intentions that it, it, all of your, you know, fans, essentially. You, you already angered the people who supported you, and it, it's not going to make up for anything. You know, BlackBerry is dying. They know it, and I think they're trying to gain some goodwill back. Well, look, everyone is really happy with their priv so far. They issued the December update. We're annoyed that it's not shipping with Marshmallow, but... Either way, they're, they're, they, they put out a pretty decent phone now that's worth taking a look at if you, if you still hold on to the BlackBerry uh, keyboard and everything else. But let's, uh, we have a few minutes left. Do you want to talk about our last story, which was your favorite, I think? Let's encrypt. Yes, yes. Uh, so we've been talking about this for a while, and it just hit today at, like, around 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, it, uh, it released in open beta, uh, and that's that's an important thing to consider. Um, it is a beta. It's kind of rough around the edges. Uh, their official client's a little annoying to use, but it works, and it works well. Um, the thing I didn't like about it, and the, the reason I've used one of the open forks, because it's an open standard, uh, is because their client requires some server downtime. Uh, which it's annoying. Um, it's on their list to fix. They are actively working on it. And hey, it's a beta. And really, that beta tag isn't there for looks or, or to get you know uh, people thinking you're the next Flickr or the next Gmail. But it's really it's beta. There's some rough edges, um, but it works and uh, it works well. I now have a great certificate. Uh, I'm working through you know my list of hosted sites and making them all secure. Uh, the certificates last by default for 90 days, but the system is designed in such a way that it's scripted out. Uh, you can, you know, fire and forget, say, hey, yeah, just re-up the cert every 90 days. Just whatever, take care of it automatically. I don't care. Um, totally free, HTTPS for everyone. It's just fantastic. Um, if you want, if you don't want to mess with the command line, if you just want, you know, a certificate that you can put in, um, I think let me let me make sure I've got this website correct. Um, yeah, I should have had this up. Before. Well, the problem is I looked at it and it doesn't seem easy, at least for someone like me. No, it's it's not perfectly easy. Um, I want to say it's called HTTPS for free, uh, but unfortunately, I cannot find the site. Um, but uh, we'll we'll include it in the show notes for you. There's actually a website that says, "Hey, run these commands and paste it in this box, and run these commands and paste it in this box." And then when you when you finish like the five steps or something, uh, you click a button and it gives you a certificate, and that's it. You're done at that point. Uh, it's great. So yeah, it's a little rough around the edges. It'll get better. It'll start being built into operating systems and server platforms, uh, but. It's free. Uh, it works. It's trusted by browsers. Um, I can't say anything bad about this. Uh, it's uh, other than it's a little rough around the edges right now, which it's being fixed. But any, it's an open protocol, open standard. You can, uh, you know, write your own code against it. You can look at other people's code. Everything that lets encrypt people uh, do is open source. You can check out what their client does. You can port it to any platform you want. Uh, it's just great. HTTPS should be everywhere, and this is the beginning. Well, let's let's hope. Let's hope that, like you said, it becomes easier and more manageable. So hopefully our New Year's resolutions will be to uh, encrypt or to SSL all the websites. Oh, yes. And we'll go from there. Anyway, anyway I think that's it, other than little, little itty-bitty stories that, okay, we can talk about. But I think that's really it for the show. Yeah. We said it's a short show, so anyway, we're we're right now officially one ahead, so probably Christmas break, something like that. I just want to plug, next week is uh, Computer Science Education Week, so look for an hour of code event if you've never programmed before, but if you're listening to this, that probably makes no sense. But if you can find a local school or whatever, you have a young child, try and get them programming. 
just for an hour next week. And again, code.org is your best bet. And I'm running something at my school. It's big and and we're really excited. So next week, hour of code if you can participate. Have a good that's it. So have a good weekend. See you, everyone. Bye. Stop. And pause.